Well, I'm appalled to see so many people here, and particularly worried because I haven't been able to see a single seriously obese individual. Now, I suppose that you all come from South Kensington and, and so on. And so Rosie set the thing, and I, I didn't realize we were here to start a revolution. And we'll have all sorts of debates during the course of this discussion, better check the time, but I'm being told I've got to give you some facts. Well, I was the crazy academic 45 years ago who wondered why middle-aged women were getting not just plump, but, you know, really round. And this was a very funny phenomenon. And we produced the first government report. And since then, from about actually 1980, we've seen a complete explosion in the problem of obesity here in the UK. And it really took off roughly about 1980 in adults and in children. And we thought that we were the crazy ones. But some years ago, they took our international standards for obesity in children and looked at 100 years back in Australia, beautiful analyses, and then they recalculated it using our cutoff points, which are almost identical with the new WHO cutoff points. And they discovered that in 1980, wow, children suddenly started getting fatter. And oddly enough, since then, we've discovered by about 1985, in the Caribbean, Latin America, they also started taking off. And now, almost wherever you go, except until recently, Southeast Asia, it's about 1990 the epidemic took off. And now in Britain, <coughs> we have a third of children who are overweight, is that what, yes, and one in five who are classified by the Department of Obese. And everybody's been congratulating themselves. We've taken real action, both the Labour government and the Tories. I mean, it's fantastic. Actually, if you look at the, the graph, we, the adults are still getting fatter, and the children haven't actually improved, contrary to what people say, for essentially the last eight to 10 years. So, Forget about this idea that we know what to do in terms of past experience. We haven't a clue. Now, why should we be that worried? Well, actually, it's because this thing is going to break the National Health Service. The commonest, biggest complication and expense, and we're going to hear about it later, is diabetes. And I've been reminded today that there are four million diabetics in this country and 700 new diabetics are diagnosed every day. And the cost is 10 billion a year for diabetes alone. We don't have the latest cost for obesity and overweight in Britain, but the McKinsey organization, not a fancy left-wing uh, group, they came out with a value of $2 trillion per year for obesity not just overweight and obesity, but for obesity. 2.8% of GDP is the problem. And 2 trillion is the equivalent of the cost of all warfare and terrorism and armed conflict anywhere in the world. And so we actually now look at a system which is going to bankrupt any health service. I do a lot in the Middle East and already a fifth of the population there of adults, 20 plus, are already diabetic. And I'm asking them to put in uh, centers for the blind, uh, change the whole traffic system, because everybody's got to have wheelchairs, uh, because they're going to have amputations and so on. And they've got to ha establish kidney dialysis units galore, because they're never going to cope uh, in the next uh, 10, 15 years. So the big question is, why did this develop? And everybody says, well, you know, we're not exercising enough. And that's true. In a, well, it is true. But have you realized that actually the car culture took off? When I was a boy, I played football in the streets. And being in North Wales, occasionally an English car came to and fro <laughs> about every two hours, you know. 
But since then, pretty well everybody's taken on cars. In fact, my mother used to have terrible trouble washing the clothes, and we had an enormous problem making the fire. Now people don't have to do that anymore. They press buttons. And then about 1985, when I was running a big institute in Scotland, um, I discovered that they used strange things called computers. And now most of you, at a guess, earn your living simply sitting down, twiddling your fingers. <laughs> now, if you think about that, that's an enormous reduction in physical activity. And actually, our food intake has gone down. But what's happened to the food? We nearly starved during the Second World War. And the whole of agricultural policy in the world was established by the British, who got a prize from America for the brilliance of our analysis. Because we now knew that to be able to feed ourselves, we needed, didn't we? Because we were very short of food, we needed plenty of energy. Butter, fats, oils, sugar, and meat. So we introduced an agricultural policy, uh, which was fantastic. <coughs> Hundreds of billions of pounds per year, in effect, on modern prices, were put in to changing the whole agricultural system. When I took uh, to, to Scotland, I walked in as this mad medic, taking over an agriculturally funded institute, and discovered the farmers had a total 100% subsidy for anything that they wanted to do in terms of dairy, systems, sheds, tractors, uh, and they had complete uh, free advice. So the whole of the food system was geared to generating fat, meat, and sugar. And there's been a collapse in the price of these foods. It's quite astonishing. And in fact, when I introduced the idea in 1983 to these uh, farmers and the academics and governments of the United States, Canada, uh, I was told that I was a complete maniac. Whereas actually what we now realize is that we've actually funded on a deliberate government policy that's been applied across the world to change the whole food system in such a way that combined with a collapse in physical activity, we are guaranteed, as the chief scientist said nearly 10 years ago, we're guaranteed all of us to get fat under current circumstances. And of course, if you're rich and highly educated, you're much more in control of your life and you can choose your foods. But now we've got to the position where foods that are healthier are far more expensive, roughly three times more expensive for an overall meal. So is it any wonder that actually um, the poorest people are now the fattest in Britain? And we're seeing this pretty well throughout the world. So what are we going to do about it? Well, you know, we've been educating people for a very long time. And in fact, I got fed up dealing with women's magazines in about 1985, where they were incessantly asking me to write stuff and t tell them about it. And since then, the epidemic has taken off, despite everything we've done. So, and it's been shown in numerous analyses. If you put top 10 priorities for doing something, then in fact, education is number 10. It's the lowest priority because the evidence is it hasn't worked. And actually the fast food restaurants and so on now correlate beautifully, not only with obesity, but with deprivation because sugar and fat are so cheap that they can throw it into anything. So what are we going to do? Well, we've been trying to do something, but Tessa Jow, I put forward a childhood obesity report in, when was it? You know, Tony Blair came in, 1997. And I was on my way to WHO to set up and establish the first ever obesity report for the whole world. And she said, oh, tell me what to do about obese children. I'm so worried about it. So we produced a report, and I put it into a, <clears throat> didn't hear anything for several weeks, and I was then called into our office, 
and in three minutes told to get out of the room because I was such a crazy Marxist that this was quite unconscionable uh, when I discovered that 136 million pounds a year was paid by children buying sweets and soft drinks on their way to and from school. And she then told me I'd better go and talk to the, the Food and Drink Federation, have you ever heard of them? <laughs> Representing the food, which I did. And I went for dinner, started talking about the Food Standards Agency and was stopped in immediately. I said, no, what about your children's report? And they slammed me for four hours, saying I was talking complete rubbish. And each one of those proposals is now regarded as appropriate and normal for children. In other words, we've had to change a whole way of thinking, but we're still locked into individualism, whether you're dealing with Blair or Cameron. Cameron saw us just before he became prime minister. He said, obesity, it's all your own fault. And actually, I will do nothing to harm the food industry. So we're in an extraordinary position where the politicians of any hue think uh, it's all your, your responsibility. But the food industries, I talk to them, they know how to do it. They manipulate the, the product. They put in flavors. They monitor neurochemistry and the response of pleasure centers in the brain. They know that if they put the price, they can manipulate the price. They promote things, and 40% of all food in Britain's now bought on the basis of promotions. And they actually put the food everywhere. So you're triggered and automatic. Oh, we're very intelligent. We go into a supermarket. If you actually put things on the end of a row, the sales go up two to five times. If it's at eye level, it's at least 40% more. They track the microseconds you stay on a label, and you redo the label so it stops the automatic brain system. Only 5% of our decisions are consciously made. So what are we going to do about it? Well, World Health and a whole series of groups have now said, we've got to change the food system. We've got to change the whole business of subsidy, but it's a problem, because we're still looking at a new world of free market TTIP negotiations between America and Germany, where, in fact, the price of sugar is going to collapse. Any manufacturer is going to say, this is wonderful, because I can put this in and I can sell more food for nothing. And so we are actually in a mega crisis because there's no way that any health service can manage unless we change the whole food system that's provided in any government institution. And we should follow France, where all marketing carries a health warning, and they tax sugar and so on. And unless we confront the fact that we can't operate on a nudge basis, because Baroness Neuberg in the House of Lords produced a brilliant report saying nudging doesn't work unless you have a huge set of other things. If only 5% of our decisions are conscious, then we've got to arrange the whole panorama of food so it is superb, pleasurable, and in fact we then have an appropriate uh, new health world where, from a planetary point of view, we can sustain ourselves, but actually we can live to a ripe old age. That's the challenge. Please start the revolution.